I'd like to start by asking you a question on your attitude towards risky behavior, a glass, and being late. Now, before some of you in the room already start feeling guilty, I'll put your mind at ease. I just want to know whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. Optimists tend to see the glass as half full, are more willing to take risks, and recent studies have shown that they're more likely to be late for things because they always underestimate traffic. <laughs> Pessimists will see the glass as half empty, are less keen to take risks, and more readily believe that negative events will occur. So, if I force you to choose, can I see a show of hands for those of you who are optimists? And those of you who are pessimists? Okay. And who out of you would only be optimistic if I told you that that glass contained alcohol? <laughs> That's something I can't help with. So we have some optimists and some pessimists in the room, probably around 60% optimists to 40% pessimists, which is representative of the general population. Society's take on this is that there are benefits to both outlooks, but that we shouldn't be too optimistic or too pessimistic. Somewhere in the middle is best. Hope for the best and expect the worst, although I'm not sure how we're meant to achieve that in practice. But now, let's look at the animal kingdom. Really exciting new research is showing us that animals can be optimistic and pessimistic too, like us. But here's where it gets really interesting. Animals change this outlook from one to the other more frequently than we do in order to best adapt to their environment. They could better be described as adaptable optimists. Now, in both humans and animals, we know that being optimistic is strongly linked to being happy. So what if we could better understand how and why those animals are more flexible in their optimism so that we could better adapt to our own environment and therefore be happier? I've spent 10 years researching animal welfare and their optimism, and my speciality is these fascinating mammals, dolphins. Today, I want to share with you some of the most surprising insights from my work and also show you that animals' approach to life can teach us a lot about how to be truly happy. So, how would you go about measuring animal happiness? Well, not so long ago, a few pioneering scientists started meticulously studying animals' behavior and found that they indeed show emotions which are similar to our own. Pain, fear, anxiety, joy, contentment. And they're also likely to experience an overall positive affective state, similar to happiness. Now, these findings formed a new discipline, animal welfare science. And this was still establishing itself when I was applying to university. I was passionate about animals, obsessed, really. But I didn't want to be a vet, and I didn't fancy spending the rest of my life snipping the testicles off dogs. <laughs> so I signed on to do this new animal behavior and welfare degree. And I found that I loved studying animal welfare, where the main goal was to piece together lots of different clues to understand how the animal might be feeling. And now, on to my study subjects. Dolphins are certainly incredible creatures. They use tools, they have the ability to see through sound, they make lifelong friendships, and they show grief-like behaviors. There was very little existing research on their emotions, so I started my career by just conducting hours and hours of observations. I then came across a breakthrough in farm animal research. Scientists had discovered a way to ask the animals whether they were optimists or pessimists. But the crucial discovery was this, that optimistic animals were always those in better welfare. Now, to put this into context, making optimistic or pessimistic decisions is called judgment bias, and of course we have this too. Originally, it would have helped us make the best decisions to survive. An individual in a good environment with food, shelter, and good social groups would have been able to take more risks and expected better outcomes from events because that's what they're used to. They'd therefore be optimistic. And the inverse is also true. Poor environments with fewer opportunities lead to more pessimistic decisions. But how on earth would you go about asking an animal whether it's optimistic or pessimistic? You couldn't exactly ask a horse if he thinks the carrot is half whole or half finished. Fortunately, researchers have come up with an ingenious way to test optimism. And I'll describe an example here with dogs. If you imagine a dog in a room, the first step of the experiment is to present it either with a bowl full of food on the left side of the room or an empty bowl on the right. Now, if you do this again and again, 
The dog will start running to the left side of the room, knowing that the bowl will be full of food, and walking slowly when it's on the right, knowing it will be empty. Once you see this difference in speed, you can then pre present it with the positions right in the middle, where it doesn't know if the bowl will be full or not. An optimistic dog would also run to that bowl, hoping it would be full, and a pessimistic do dog would walk slowly, assuming it would be empty. Judgment bias study started with rats, and it was found that rats, when they were living in stimulating, enriching cages, they were more optimistic, and when those same rats were moved to empty, poor, and barren cages, they were more pessimistic. And you can see why these findings were exciting. This was a way to ask the animal what it thought about its environment, and a really good measure of animal welfare and happiness. Seeing the potential of this approach, I decided to ask whether the dolphins were optimistic or pessimistic. To do these kind of cognitive tests, I was working with captive dolphins. It just wouldn't be possible in the wild. I also wanted to get behind the scenes in captive dolphin facilities to apply scientific methods to measure their welfare, something which hadn't been done before. And our results were fascinating. We found that the most optimistic dolphins in the group were also those that had the better social bonds, measured by their time spent swimming in synchrony together. And this makes sense for a social species. Better bonds means the animal has more support, can take more risks, and is therefore more optimistic and happier. And from all the years of human happiness research, this is also one of the only reliable results. Good quality social relationships are a key factor in our own happiness. Now, a great story showing this with the dolphins was that of Squirt. She was a, an adult female dolphin who was living in Florida, and she was the boss lady of the pool. But she still had great social relationships with the others lower down in the pecking order. Now, Squirt lived in a sea pen, uh, which was just a fenced off part of the sea through which um, fish could come and go as they liked through the holes in the fence. One day, we were feeding Squirt her daily fish, and we chucked a capelin in her mouth, which is a type of small fish. And instead of swallowing it, she placed it between her teeth and swam off to the fence. We then saw her poke this little fish through the holes in the fence, in front of where the much larger wild fish were milling around. And one of them took the bait, and as quick as a flash, she grabbed it, dragged it back through the fence, and came back to show us her supersized meal. <laughs> Very pleased with herself there. Now, apart from showing how incredibly clever dolphins are, this is also a risky behavior. A squirt sacrificed eating that smaller fish right away, and she could have lost it altogether. However, she was in a good environment. She was well-fed, she particularly enjoyed her training sessions, and she had great social bonds. She was an optimistic dolphin and willing to take more risks. But an equally important point I've also learned from the dolphins is this. We can never take our environment for granted. Our surroundings are always changing, and therefore so are the factors which determine our happiness and our optimism. Now, animals are masters at reading and responding to their environment. If their current surroundings change, they simply adjust their level of optimism to best match it. This adaptable optimism allows them to not only survive in their environment, but also to take advantage of all the opportunities and, and thrive. Now, unfortunately, as humans, and especially in today's modern world, we're not so good at this matching. If we find ourselves in poor current surroundings, society will often tell us to stay optimistic. For example, cancer patients are often told they must just be positive. And then, if we find ourselves in good current surroundings, we will always find ways to be negative about it convincing ourselves that the grass is always greener on the other side. Dr. Susan David, a Harvard Medical School psychologist, agrees and says that being positive has become the new form of moral correctness, where any other approach is viewed as if you're not trying hard enough. She says that we actually need to accept these bad situations for what they are and listen to the emotions associated with them in order to deal with the problem in a more honest way. Therefore, if you find yourself feeling a bit more pessimistic, there's no need to immediately suppress these feelings. I'm not saying that we shouldn't look on the bright side of life. If you can, always do. But if you find yourself feeling a bit more negative over a period of time, let yourself feel that and consider what it means. It's your brain and body trying to protect you from the environment you're in. The importance of protecting ourselves in this way was shown in much more extreme circumstances by the legendary US Naval officer Jim Stockdale, 
who was captured and held prisoner with many of his men during the Vietnam War for eight years. Now, many years after the event, Stockdale was asked about the difference between the men that made it and those that didn't. He said that the optimists were those who believed they would get up the next day, or week, or month, didn't make it. The survivors were those who maintained an overall optimistic outlook, i.e. that they would get out one day, but who ultimately were more pessimistic about their day-to-day -day reality. Now, all of us are extremely lucky not to have to face that brutal reality that Stockdale and his men did, but this lesson is still highly applicable to our current lives. It's so important that we have this prevailing optimism, that we will get over whatever life throws at us in the end. All animals have this, of course, and it's part of what makes up their survival instinct. Stockdale also showed us that being a little bit more pessimistic sometimes can help us get through tough periods in a more honest and effective way and back on track towards happiness. I saw this firsthand with the dolphins when I was working with Guama. He's here in the middle, he's an adult male, and those are his two sons, Equinox and Nazca. Now, when this, some, this photo was taken, Guama was often swimming with his sons and the other dolphins and was measurably a happy animal. Then along came Cecil, another dominant male, and he effectively took all Guama's friends, including his sons. Guama became, uh, he swam with the others less and less, and he became more pessimistic. Over this period of time, we also noticed that Guama became closer with his human caretakers. He was more tactile with them and would be waiting around by the side of the pool for them to come and play with him. Now, if we look at this situation as a whole, Guama's adaptable optimism helped him get through this tough period by directing him away from those stressful dolphin relationships and towards the less risky but still rewarding elements of his life, in this case, his trainers. This story happened over a couple of months, and it links back to the point about our ever-changing environment. If you imagine your own life, every few weeks or months, there are little factors or circumstances which change. For example, a new project at work might start, or a friend decides to move away. While we might have some overall personality level bias, if we're also rigid in our day-to-day -day pessimistic and optimistic outlooks, we might not be able to deal as best we can with these good and bad changes. However, we also shouldn't avoid both optimism and pessimism and try and stay bang in the middle, a realist as some call it. This is also an inflexible approach and wouldn't allow us to take those big fish risks when we're feeling good, like squirt the dolphin, nor fully protect ourselves when we're feeling down, like Guama finding solace in his trainers. For me, adaptable optimism is a lesson I've learned personally. I used to think of myself as a die-hard optimist, and the past few years for me have been filled with exciting opportunities and a stable group of friends. Then, earlier this year, I finished my job, I moved countries, and I started up my own business, all within the space of a few months. I didn't have my own place to live, and I was struggling to find enough work to make a living. Convincing myself that I needed to be optimistic, I carried on living life as I'd always done, taking big risks in my work opportunities, but also with my social life. However, when we're feeling less happy like I was, we don't bounce back as we normally do when these risks don't pay off, when the big fish don't bite. I found the fallout hit me a lot harder, and it started pushing me into a downward spiral towards chronic unhappiness, which, once you're there, can be really hard to get out of. So, I looked at the animals and I tried a different approach. Adapt and behave more like a pessimist. And this ended up helping me a lot, especially with my social life. Instead of making hundreds of plans with distant friends and having them cancelled, I focused on my more reliable friends and spent time in these more stable, reliable relationships. So, what can we all do to become more adaptable optimists? Well, in order to adapt, we need to become better at understanding our environment and recognizing, and more importantly, accepting the emotions that arise in response to it. Like with affecting any change, we can break this down to measuring, reviewing, and adapting. A useful technique I've started is to write down three good things that have happened every day to better keep track of happy and less happy periods. But whatever way you find best to keep track of your emotional state, being more aware will help you match your level of optimism to the environment. A new idea called zoognosis, 
coined by the world-class marine mammal vet, Dr. Claire Simeone, describes the knowledge transfer between humans and animals. She says that instead of only asking what we can learn about animals, we should also be asking what we can learn from them. What can animals, like these curious dolphins, teach us? Their adaptable optimism is a great example. Today, they've shown us that we should be prevailing optimists, as all animals are, keeping the faith that we will be able to get over whatever life throws at us in the end. At the same time, being a little less rigid in our day-to-day -day optimistic and pessimistic outlooks should help us thrive and be happier. For those of you who said you were optimists, when you hit hard times, remember to trust those negative emotions and let them guide you through. Like I learned, sometimes you have to embrace those more reliable little fish opportunities that are right in front of you. And for those of you who said you were pessimists, this is a perfectly normal, adaptive response. Keeping track of your emotions and surroundings more often may help you understand when it's time to be more optimistic and go after life's big fish. Thank you very much.